Great to have you guys here today. Let's go ahead and turn in your Bibles to chapter 12 of the book of 1 Corinthians. Last week, um, we were going through uh, a passage of Scripture, and I, I wasn't able to finish it. And so what it does, it gives us a great opportunity to do a little bit of a topical on a, on a passage we already looked at last week. So right now, we're going through a study on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so as we've been going through there, you remember as we uh, left off in, in chapter 12, verse 8 through 11, gives us a list of the gifts of the Spirit. Not all of the gifts of the Spirit, not a complete list, as Paul is illustrating the fact that within the body of Christ, each one of us is given special gifts, special talents and abilities to minister to one another within the body of Christ for the purpose of doing the work of the ministry. And we can just go through there and read those once again to give a flavor for it. It says in verse 8, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as He wills. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we do come to You once again, Lord, and we are looking forward to studying Your Word together. We are dependent upon You, Father, to give us the true interpretation of Your Word, and we just wait on You for that. Our hearts are open to You to teach us, to mold us, to shape us into the image of Your Son, and we ask that You would do that here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well again, uh, the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, we went through and we looked at the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Uh, we looked at prophecy last week. We looked at uh, discerning of spirits. And so we kind of came to the end of our time and, and weren't able to get into those other gifts. And today we will get into those things. Uh, it's interesting, any kind of organization that, that employs vehicles or uh, any kind of equipment to accomplish their mission you know, you have to have some folks that are dedicated to maintaining those vehicles, uh, whether you're talking about Caltrans or the military or anybody else. You know, you have to have a group of people that are, are taking care of those vehicles and fixing them and repairing them and upkeeping uh, the maintenance on those vehicles so that they can go and do the operation of, of that organization, whatever that happens to be. And, uh, you know, it seems like there's always a, a conflict between those two departments. The operations department says, hey, we need four vehicles this afternoon to accomplish our mission. And the maintenance guys are going, oh, man, we only have three. Uh, we got to get this other one repaired, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done on it. And, and certainly as I was going through the, uh, my time in the military, you know, I ran into that a lot. I worked for uh, the maintenance department half of the time, and then I worked for the operations department half of the time as well. And there was all the, always this conflict going on between those two departments, uh, trying to get the airplanes up and running so that we can go accomplish our mission. And at one point, I was a, I was a maintainer, but I also actually worked in the operations department. And I always had this, uh, this constant friction with the maintenance guys uh, because I was taking air crewmen that were working in the maintenance department and flying them all the time. And I remember very clearly one day the operations officer told one of the maintenance guys, and, I, and I'll never forget what he said to him. He said, you know, we don't exist, and he was complaining about the maintenance, you know, we, we need more time to do maintenance on the aircraft, and, and, uh, and so the operations department head said, you know what, we don't exist for the purpose of doing maintenance on airplanes. We exist for the purpose of flying these airplanes and accomplishing the mission. And, and so often we get in the mindset just in the military or whatever, of thinking, you know, it's just, we're here just to maintain. But we're not. We're here to actually do the mission. And just like in the church, you know, uh, here we are, we're in the hangar. We're in the garage. We're in the hospital, if you will. And we are repairing. We're doing maintenance. We're uh, building up and helping each other so that we can go out and do the work of the ministry. Go out and do the mission outside of these walls. We're not coming here. We don't exist for the purpose of coming to church on Sunday morning. 
Uh, and so as we looked at last week, we have some gifts that are being used here to do that upkeep maintenance on each other, to build each other up, to repair each other, because we get broken and we get damaged out there in the world as we're doing the mission. And as we go through this life, we, we get damaged, we get injured, we get wounded, and we need to be repaired. We need to be built up in our faith in the Lord. We need to be built up in our understanding of God's Word. We need to be equipped so that we can go out and do the work of the ministry. And I think as we look at these gifts, you can see very clearly in the gifts, as we looked at last week, that there are many gifts, you know, 18 to 20 uh, listed throughout various places in Scripture that you can look at. And a great majority of those gifts are for the purpose of building up, repairing. And I don't want to go through and read the whole list again, but you you remember we looked at uh, quite a few of them last week and talked about them a little bit. The the vast majority of those are to build up and to strengthen and, and to repair. But today, we're going to look at the other aspect of that in in a great degree. You know, we have these ministry gifts that help repair each other. But then we also have the activity gifts or the signs gifts. These tremendous gifts that are used uh, to show the outside world that God is powerful and that God wants to do a work in the lives of people everywhere. And, And so those are the gifts that we'll look at today, often called signs gifts. These are gifts that are are great signs and wonders uh, for the unbelieving world to see the power of God at work in the church. And it's interesting, that word activity there, and and we're taking this from uh, verse 6. You remember as we were going through the the first study in the gifts of the Spirit, back in verse 6 it says, or actually starting in verse 5, it says differences of ministries. So we have the ministry gifts, and then we have there are diversities of activities. Activities. God working in powerful ways. God moving. And we talk about the move of the Spirit. And, and God doing some work. God's doing some things. You know, that church over there, boy, God's moving. God's working. He's, he's got a lot of things going on. And so we see this ministries, different ministries and their diversities of activities, di- diversities of ways that God is working. And He often shows those through the signs that we're going to talk about today. That word activity there comes from the Greek word energema or energema. And of course, we get our word energy from that. The idea of of producing work, expending energy to produce something. And as we look at that word, it's interesting, it's just defined as operations, workings, outward manifestations, and results of spiritual gifts. The results of the work that is going on in here should be translating out there into that community that we live in. But so often within the body of Christ, you know, hey, we want to see all those works at work here. And people begin to complain if you don't see a lot of different uh, gifts that are being used here in a corporate setting. All that church, is, they're not walking in the Spirit. You know, the work is going on out there. You're coming in here to get equipped and repaired to go out there and do the work. It, it, it's a fast food religion that you and I uh, are participating in here on a Sunday morning a lot of times. You know, people go... I want to find a church that I can get my fix for the week. I can get my religious fix. I can get the teaching of God's Word. I can worship the Lord. I can pray. I can see the gifts of the Spirit working. And then I'm done. I don't need anything else for the rest of the week. But that is certainly not how God has set it up. It's not how God has set it up at all. Operations, gifts of the Spirit, the movement of the the Lord out in that community that we live in. We see this as the, the power of God at work. And you and I need that power in our lives. We need that power at work. And the word power, as we're going to look at here in a minute, is the word dunamis in the Scripture. The Greek word dunamis, a force, a miraculous power, ability, mighty deeds, strength, violence, uh, is the definition there. And that's the, wor- that's the word that we get our word dynamite from. A dynamite power at work in the lives of believers who are built up in their faith in the Lord and are able to go out those doors and use those gifts that you've been given by the Lord. Not only to build each other up, but to go out and do a powerful work in our community that we live in. 
And so another verse that we can look at in 1 Thessalonians, Paul wrote to that church, a very healthy church, uh, a church that was moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not like the church we're reading about in 1 Corinthians, who are struggling and who are carnal. This church, Paul writes to them and says, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in dunamis, dynamite power. We didn't just come talking to you guys. We didn't just come and and share a few words with you. Our, Our gospel came to you in word, but not word only, but also in power, in deed. Power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became examples to all who believe. For from the word, from, from you, the word of the Lord sounded forth. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. That church in Thessalonica saw a group of men who had the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. They were professing it from their lips and they saw the power at work in their lives as well. And as a result of that, they said, yeah, that's real. We want to follow that faith. We want to go after that. And they became examples to others as they went out and began to spread the word and God was using them in a powerful way as well. They didn't need to be corrected like the Corinthian church. And so it's interesting, you know, as as we uh, exist in this time in the beginning of the the 21st century, you know, logic has replaced the need for God's miraculous works. And we we take the miracles that we see in the Bible, it seems that the church is doing more and more and just setting them aside and saying, well, that just isn't at work anymore. That's not happening anymore. We don't see that anymore. That was for another time. And and that's just not going on anymore. And as a result, you know, our, our faith is pretty weak. And the community doesn't see a whole lot of power at work. They don't see a whole lot of dynamite being exploded like we read about in the early pages. And again, I think to a large degree, it's because we're, we're always in the hangar. We're always in the hangar. We're always in the, the repair facility. And we're afraid to go out and use those gifts that God has given us and put them to work in the community. But Jesus said... At the very end of the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 16, verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. And what are the signs that are going to follow those who believe? What's interesting, they're the exact same things that we're looking at here this morning. Sign, gifts. The gifts or the signs that will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So what do we have right there? We have the working of miracles. We have healing, both in a spiritual sense and in a physical sense. And we have tongues being used. The four things that we're looking at to, or the Three things that we're looking at today, and then you have the interpretation of tongues as well. But those are the signs. Those are the signs that will follow those who believe. Not only will they be using the gifts of the Spirit to build each other up and to strengthen each other and to equip each other, but as they go out and they preach that message, message, those signs will follow behind them. They're not the main thing. They're not the thing that should be seen all the time, and they're not seen all the time. But those things will characterize those who believe. And so as we go back and look at this together here today, again, spiritual gifts, we're going to look at those things that we didn't cover last week, the healings and the miracles, and then also tongues and interpretation of tongues. Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh, man, I just don't want to deal with this subject. I just wish we didn't have to talk about that stuff. 
But it's here. It's here in the Word of God, and we need to understand it because at the beginning of our discussion on the gifts, what did Paul say? Hey, I don't want you to be ignorant. Concerning spiritual gifts, church in Corinth, you're ignorant. (laughs) I don't want you to be ignorant, and so here we go. Let's learn about these things. And so it gives us a great opportunity to go into it. And uh, to be honest, you know, right from the beginning, we're not going to go greatly uh, into detail on the gifts of the uh, tongues today and the interpretation of it because that's one of the main problems that this church had is the overusage and the abuse of that one particular gift, the gift of tongues. And that is one of the main reasons that Paul is addressing them. And for the next two and a half chapters, Paul at various times is going to bring up the subject of tongues because of the way they were using that gift. And so uh, for that reason, I don't want to go into great detail because we'll be talking about it quite a bit here in the next couple of, uh, well, the next two, three weeks anyway. And so as we begin here, gifts of healings. You know, one of the amazing prophecies within the Bible uh, about the end times is given here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says in verse 1, but know this, in the last days, and we believe, of course, that we're living in the last days, don't we? In the last days, perilous times will come. What kind of perilous times, Paul? Well, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, without self-control, brutal despisers of good, uh, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Do we see that today? Obviously we do. We see that everywhere we look. Those kind of things characterize the times that we're living in, especially the last one. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Man, people will go to every length to fulfill the pleasures of the flesh. But to please God and to seek after God, uh, it's, it's not in the equation, really. He goes on there, though, and he says, having a form of godliness but denying its power. They're not lovers of God, but they want to have a form of godliness. They want to look somewhat like they believe in God and and have some kind of religious, spiritual uh, characteristic about their life, some element of spirituality about their life. But they don't love God. They just want to look spiritual. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. It's power, and from such people turn away. You and I don't want to be characterized in that way. As a church, we don't want to be known as a church that has a form of godliness. We come to church and we act godly and we, you know, uh, carry on and do some religious things, but we deny the power behind what we're saying. And I think, you know, as, as we talk about this subject the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and talk about working miracles and, and, and seeing healings uh, be done and seeing God's power at work in the lives of not only believers here in the church, but people out in the community. When we say that these gifts are for another time, we deny the power that the Bible talks about. We deny the power that, that Paul is describing to these Corinthians and really describes throughout the New Testament. We deny the works that were done in the book of Acts as being works that can be done today. And and it really severely weakens the church, I think, because it's just a lack of faith on our, our part to say, well, those things just don't happen anymore. I would like to see more people get healed. People do get healed now, but I'd like to see it more. I'd like to see more miracles. But, you know, that, that really belongs in, in God's authority. We're going to talk about that a little bit here today. It's interesting, he says, the gifts of healings. Two S's there. Plural on both of them. And in your Bible, it might not have both of the S's. I looked at a couple of different translations. But here in the Bible I'm reading from, gifts of healings. And, and so there's a great variety of those, obviously. You know, certainly we can look at the fact that God heals us spiritually, and and truly that is the greatest miracle right there. The fact that somebody can go from being 
completely demon-possessed or at least controlled by the power of Satan to the point of destroying themselves and their mind is completely warped and, and, and just debased and, and just in absolute sinful uh, debauchery. And God can take that person and, and take that completely away from them and make them a new creature, a new creation, totally change their nature and make them into a person who now has a life that is fulfilled with joy and purpose. And what a miracle that is. But we him and haw about that, don't we? Well, that's not a real miracle. I mean, yeah, but it's not the miracles we want to see. You know, we want to see legs that are longer than the other, you know, kind of get even again and all that kind of stuff. You know, those parlor trick kind of things. We want to see those. What an amazing miracle that is, though, to see a life completely transformed. A life that is destroyed to a life that is fulfilled. It's an amazing thing. And certainly that is part of it. As, as we looked at, you know, one of the signs that follow those who believe is demons will be cast out of them. As people come to faith in Jesus Christ, they no longer are controlled by demonic forces. They're no longer under the control of Satan. And they, he's been, they've been snatched out of the hand of Satan and taken and placed into the kingdom of God. It's an amazing miracle. But obviously we see within uh, the New Testament not only that kind of miracle of a changed life, uh, healed emotions and healed uh, mindset and, and psyche and all those kind of things, but we also see physical healings taking place. You know, I was thinking about that story where Jesus... Uh, you know, there's a man who is blind from birth and they say, hey, who sinned, this man or his parents? Which one sinned? And Jesus said, neither one. Uh, But for the power of God to be displayed, for the glory of God, you know, that's why this is taking place. This man's going to be healed to give God glory and to bring about uh, a sign that will give people an indication of how powerful God truly is so that he may be glorified. And so it's a wonderful thing as far as that idea goes. Well, I want to look at uh, Acts chapter 4 for just a minute here. If you can hold your place there in 1 Corinthians for just a second. Going back to Acts chapter 24, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 4. In verse 28, it's an amazing point where Peter and, and John were arrested and then they were set free. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a miracle going on there just that they were set free. And, and so they're going back to their companions there. And in verse 24, as you're turning there, it says, uh, so, when they heard that, so when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And you can skip down a little bit to verse 27. For truly against your Sir, holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. And I think that's a key there. Whatever your purposes are, God, whatever your hand determined, whatever your purposes are, according to your purposes, we want to be in line with that. According to your will, we want to be in line with that. Whatever it is. If you want to do a healing, if you want to do an amazing miracle, Lord, use us. We're there for you. Uh, You know, it's hard for us to believe that miracles can come to pass. But if you want to use us in that way, we are available. And I think that is the key for the church today. You know, uh, we do believe that these gifts are, are for the present time that we live in. We don't see them all the time. We don't want to be manufacturing them. But I think just coming to a place of saying, Lord, If you want to use us, we're ready. Use us. We believe you can do anything. You created the heavens. You created the earth. There is nothing impossible for you. And if you want to heal this person of blindness, if you want to heal this this person of brain cancer or whatever it is, Lord, we're there. And we'll pray for them and we'll lay hands on them and anoint them with oil. And if you heal them, we'll praise you for it. If you don't heal them, we'll praise you for it as well. And I think that's really the, the point the church needs to be at. It's just coming to a place of, of understanding God can do anything. 
God can still do anything in the time that we're living in. And not to deny that power. Have that faith. And in verse 29, he says, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. With boldness. Speaking out the name of the Lord with boldness. Proclaiming His victory over death with boldness. And the Lord comes and grants that signs and wonders. You, Lord, stretch out your hand that signs and wonders may be done. That people may be healed. We believe that God can do that. And so we see there in that passage that, you know, uh, the Lord bringing those signs and wonders and those healings is a, uh, a, you know, just a, a proof of the word of God being spoken in a powerful way there. And to back that up. Turning back over to 1 Corinthians, though, um, another passage that we can look at in Acts chapter 3. You know, when we talk about healings, one of, the, one of the great healings that we see early on in the church here in, in chapter 3 of Acts is, is Peter and John going to the temple to pray. And they come across this man who has been lame uh, from birth. And they walk up to him. And of course, the man is, is begging. He's wanting some money. And uh, Peter says to him here, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, we know that that's the power of God doing that work. We know that only God can do that miracle. Only God can perform that miracle. But what did it take for Peter? Peter had to have some faith. He had to have a gift of faith that that you and I, I, I don't know that, any of us can understand that kind of faith. <laughs> I know I can't. Can you imagine walking up to somebody who's lame since birth and grabbing him and just pulling him up? Believing that God's going to heal him? I mean, there's a gift of faith at work there. There's a gift of healing at work there because you've got to have the faith to believe that God can do the healing. And, and somehow Peter knew that God was going to do it because he just went over there and did it. It's an amazing thing. A gift of miracles, a gift of faith, a gift of healing, all wrapped up into one. And so many of these gifts really uh, just complement each other. And, and there are several at work at the same time. And, uh, and so we can see definitely a, a powerful demonstration of those gifts right there in that, t- in that uh, story that we read about Peter. A gift of healing. An amazing, amazing thing. It takes a lot. It definitely takes a, a, a person who has that gift to go and do something like that. And we ask that question, why doesn't it happen today? Acts 14, 2-3, The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of His grace granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And again, you see there, the signs and wonders come after. They follow the teaching of God's Word as a reinforcement of the fact that there's some power behind the words that are being said. Power behind those words. Well, I'm speaking here today, and and every Sunday we preach the Word of God, and we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and we're preaching it. And we don't hold back anything. And you still ask that question, well, where are the signs and wonders? Where are the signs and wonders that are coming behind and reinforcing the words that I'm speaking here? Fair question, isn't it? Fair question. And so we ask, why doesn't God work that way today? Why doesn't God work that way today? And what I always like to do in, that, in this situation, you know, in dealing with this subject, is to turn it right around and ask the question back to us, why don't we work in that way today? 
why don't we go out into the community and give God a chance to work in that way? That's a fair question, isn't it? Why don't we have the faith to go out boldly and proclaim the message of God to the community? I mean, it's one thing to stand here and preach the message to a bunch of believers who are saying amen and and giving me big smiles and, and saying, yeah, right on, I believe that, amen. But it's quite another thing to go out there and do it on a Saturday night at Hearts Alive, isn't it? It is. I'm scared to death. I went out street witnessing with a, a good friend of mine at one time. This was years ago, 15 years ago or so. And we were just on fire for the Lord, man. And we wanted to go out and proclaim the message and, and be a Acts chapter 2 kind of a church. And, and, uh, and so we decided, you know, we were going around witnessing to people. And, uh, and that was hard enough. And then one, one Friday night, we decided to call somebody in the middle of church and have their cell phone ring. And uh, just kidding, brother. And, and so one Friday night, we decided, man, we are going to go out and preach on the street. We're going to get up on a corner. And it was kind of a boardwalk kind of situation in Portsmouth, Virginia. And I mean, this place was packed. There were all kinds of bars down there. And and every Friday and Saturday night, there were just tons of people out there. And we're going to go out and we're going to preach to these people. And I had a message that I had put together. And so we got down there and I was terrified. I couldn't get up. I couldn't say anything. I just could not. And to this day, the idea of standing on a street corner preaching just scares me to death. I mean, no way. I just can't do it. Can't do it. But again... You know, what, the things that we see in the book of Acts, the, the boldness that we see with these guys, and just the no fear to go out in front of people who are going to stone you to death and proclaim that Jesus died and rose from the dead for your sins and that you need to have a relationship with him. To No fear at all. Just preach that message. To walk up to somebody and grab them by the hand to, and, and yank them up out of that, that wheelchair. You know, those things. You know, we just don't have the boldness to do that today. And there are a lot of other things, you know, and uh, I brought up Hearts Alive already, and, and I just wanted to, I don't want to make you feel guilty about this. I want to say that right from the beginning. Don't, don't feel any condemnation in what I'm about to say. Hearts Alive is a great opportunity for us to go out and be a ch- Acts chapter 2 kind of a church. It's a great opportunity for us to go out into community once a month. This is only once a month. The apostles were doing this kind of stuff every day of the week, going out there, preaching the word on the streets, and sharing their faith with people, and debating with people. Because that's where we really need that power, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to go out and do that, you better have some power behind you, right? You better have the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. If you're not willing to go out there and do that kind of stuff, you don't need the power, do you? Hey, if you're going to stay home on a Saturday night and watch TV, do you really need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that? God meets us at that place when we really need it and we're bold enough to say, Lord, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do. I'm going to go out and do exactly what I see in your word. I'm going to have the faith to believe that you can do all things. And I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start preaching your message. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to just minister to people on the streets with the gifts that I've been given. Maybe it's not a gift of of healing. Maybe it's not a gift of, of miracles. But you have a gift. And when you are bold enough to say, I'm going to be faithful to do what God has told me to do. I'm going to be faithful to use the gifts and the talents that He's given me. And I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do it. God will meet you at that place. And God will give you the power to do it. Again, Hearts Alive is is a great opportunity for us to do that as a church. And, you know, when we started coming up with the idea to go out and do it on on, during Arts Alive, uh, one Saturday out of the month, I thought, yeah, that'd be a great opportunity for us to go out there as a church and just minister to the community that we're in like they did in the book of Acts. But I have got to tell you, the amount of people that come out to Hearts Alive is pretty minuscule. Pretty minuscule. And when we're out there, you know, most of us aren't very bold. Most of us aren't very bold. We need to be more bold. 
Because, you know, it just shows how much faith we have in the things that we're saying. It shows how much faith that we have in, in God's Word and what He's able to accomplish when we step out in boldness and just say, all right, Lord, meet me there. Meet me there. Take a step of faith, Jesus says. The Bible says over and over, take a step of faith. Step into that Jordan River, and as soon as your foot hits that water, the waters will stop. God says, come on, how much do you trust me? How much do you believe in me? How much faith did it take Peter to reach out and grab that guy's hand? I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have, I give it to you. Get up. It's it's really powerful if you think about it in that way. God wants us to take a step of faith, and he'll meet us there when we do that. And so again, not condemnation on you here, but we ask that question, God, why are you so weak today? Why is the church so weak today? Why aren't you doing more? What? What's going on? Why aren't you working in the way you used to work? Why aren't we working in the way that they used to work back in the early church? That's the question I have for us today. Why are we still in the hangar, in the garage, in the hospital, when we need to be out there on the mission field? And it's a conviction for me as well. If it's convicting to you, it's twice as convicting to me because I know that we're not working in a powerful way in this community. And we're teaching the Word, and I know people are getting equipped here, and I know you're being built up, and and there's a lot of love here, and that's good. But to see this kind of power at work in our church, it's going to take some sacrifice. It's going to take some people stepping out in faith and getting over, you know, whatever kind of uh, fears that we have related to these things. And just believing in the Lord, trusting in Him. Not trusting in our own power and our own abilities, but trusting in Him, that He'll meet us there at that place. Well, I think another reason that we see such a weakness within the church and and, and we just don't see these powerful demonstrations of of God working is because, you know, uh, here we see in in Acts chapter 4 again, verse 32, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands excuse me, or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each one as anyone had need. And so we read stuff like that, and then we compare that to what we're doing today as a church, as a body of believers. And it doesn't match up, does it? We want to see the miracles. We want to see the signs. We want to see the power that we see in the book of Acts. But we're not willing to be like those people in the book of Acts. And so I don't, I don't say that God's weak. God doesn't work in that way at all. God says, take a step of faith. Trust in me. Believe in me to the degree that these people believed in me. And you might start seeing some more things going on. I talked to you guys a little bit about, you know, when I came back from Guatemala and just seeing the abject poverty down there. And you see these churches that every night of the week, They're there worshiping the Lord with everything they've got. Worshiping the Lord for hours on end every night of the week. Singing out at the top of their lungs. Why? Well, many of them just don't have anything else. That's all they've got. But that's okay. It's good to come to a place of saying, all I've got is Jesus. All I've got is my relationship with the Lord. I don't have money. I don't have places to go. I don't have things to do. All I've got is the Lord, and I'm going to worship Him every night of the week. Man, for some of us, that's exactly what we need. Maybe we need a a major financial disaster to happen in our country. Somebody sent me an article the other day saying, we need another Dunkirk. 
You know, it happened at Dunkirk in World War II, and I, I don't remember the story real well, so I won't go in detail on it. But, but basically, some British soldiers were trapped on a beach, and they were going to be wiped out by the Germans. The Germans were on the way. These, these uh, British soldiers had no way of escaping, and, and they were just sitting ducks. And the British people came, 30,000 people, came out and prayed for a miracle. Prayed for a miracle. Prayed for God to do something. And, and it really truly was a, a, a time of national tragedy as, as the Germans were bombing the nation and, and really they were on the brink of being wiped out as a, as a nation, as a nation, uh, as a country. And the Germans were about to take over. 30,000 people came out and prayed for that situation. And there was a major miracle that happened. I mean, uh, families and, and people, anybody that had a boat, they, they just crossed that, that channel there, the English Channel, I believe it was, and went over and, and rescued those soldiers and got them out of there. And none of them perished as a result. It was an amazing miracle. I wish I'd read up on it more to be able to give you more details. But, you know, we need another Dunkirk in our nation. Sadly, we need something tragic to bring us back to a place of depending on the Lord in the way that we should as a nation. And within the church, you know, we, we just have so many things going on in our lives and so many things that are so much more important than uh, the things that we're talking about here. And as a result, you know, I think a lot of times we don't see the power that we'd like to see. Again, we're a fast food society. Go to church. I hope to see everything I want to see there, miracles and everything else on Sunday morning and get my dose and, and then I'll go on my way. We don't want to have the sacrifice that it takes to, to really uh, see the power of God at work in our lives. Galatians 3, 3 through 5 says, Oh foolish, are, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? It's a good question. Of course, the Galatians, you know, they wanted to revert back to the law. The Judaizers had come in and told them, well, okay, you know, you're saved, you believe in Jesus, but you still need to be circumcised, you still need to keep the law, and wanted to take them back down that road of not walking in the Spirit, but going back to the law and being a slave to that law. Paul says, hey, if you began in the Spirit, are you, do you think you're going to be perfected by going back to the law, going back to the power of, of keeping something in the power of your flesh? those works of miracles, those things that are being done in you, it's coming from the Spirit. James 4.3 says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. And I think a lot of times, you know, we're praying for miracles and we're praying for things, but it's really, we're just praying so that we can, you know, like the multitudes that follow Jesus around, we just want to see some signs and wonders. Come on, show us some signs and wonders. It'll fulfill some kind of desire of my flesh. And, and that's the, really the reason that we're praying for it. We're praying to see signs and wonders because not because we want to see lots of people get saved out there, but because it's exciting to see signs and wonders. And God says... I'm not a magician. I'm not here to fulfill any kind of, of entertainment needs that you might have. God says, if you want to see the power that I have at work in the world that you live in today, it, there's a need for a sacrifice. There's a need for humbleness. There's a need for brokenness. There's a need for obedience and holiness. A need for faith to see those things. 
Well, we're running out of time here. Again, I'm not going to spend much time on the, on the gifts of tongues here uh, because we will be talking about it uh, a lot. Um, but you see there in verse 10 to another, the working of miracles in another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues or varieties of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now, obviously, when we talk about the gift of tongues, we go back to Acts chapter 2. And we'll just read that real quick because that's the first time that we really see it within the New Testament. And, uh, and it's the key passage that we look to for that. And in Acts chapter 2, it says, The day of Pente- Pentecost had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues of fire and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And of course, you know the story. You know, uh, the sound went out of all these tongues being spoken. And and we know that these tongues, in, in particular here, were different languages because there were people from all over that region that were there on that day uh, for this feast. And so people from all different languages started to hear in their own languages people praising God, people declaring the wonderful works of God. And they all came together and said, what is this? What's going on here? These men are from Galilee. What's going on? How are they able to praise God, these simple fishermen in in my language, in all these different languages? What's going on here? Well, they're drunk some of them said. And then Peter, of course, got up and said, no, they're not drunk. This is the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out just as Joel prophesied about. And so uh, it's interesting, you know, I always bring back this this particular story and, and I think we have to make the connection between what happened in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel and what is happening here. In Genesis chapter 11, we found that all of the nations of the earth were together as one and they all spoke the same language. And they became very defiant against God. They became very rebellious against God. They said, hey, we're going to build a tower to the heavens. And they, so they start building this tower to the heavens. And God said, all the nations are one. They'll be able to accomplish anything. And he confused their languages. They were defiant against God is the key there, though. They weren't in cooperation with God's purposes and God's will. They were against those purposes. And they said, we're going we're we're to be on our own here. We're going to build this tower. And so God confused their languages. And as a result, they couldn't work together. And, and so they began to spread out and, and went their separate ways. And, and we find what we have today is people all over the world with different languages and different dialects of those languages and, and, and different ways of speaking. And science even concurs that all languages can come back to one particular language. And so we know that that's true from a scientific perspective. And so now as God is beginning to do a whole new work and He wants the whole world to know about it, He wants the message of Jesus Christ to get out to the whole world. As he begins to do that new work, he pours out his spirit on a group of people who are able to now speak in all those languages so that there are no barriers to keep people from being able to understand the truth of Jesus Christ. And so I I think that we can see the spirit gave them that utterance, but it was a symbolic thing to go back to that Tower of Babel. Hey, the Tower of Babel split everybody apart and scattered people all over the world. And, and now as a result, we, we can't communicate with one another. But now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can communicate with one another. And that message can go out. And so it's a very effective message of getting that message out to the world, the message of Jesus Christ. And those people who heard it that day and, and came to believe in Jesus Christ, They took that message back to the places that they lived. And as a result, the the gospel message began to spread all over the world from that point in all different languages. And so I think that is definitely one of the purposes of the gift that we see. It's the first time that it's mentioned here 
But is it a valid gift, spiritual gift for today? We ask that question. What is the purpose of the gift if it is valid for today? Now, I want to say right off the bat, I do believe it is a valid gift for today, uh, primarily in the sense of uh, personal praise and worship and, and prayer to the Lord. And I think that we can see that scripturally. Uh, we're going to look at later on in uh, coming chapters here that it's an edifying of myself. And so that's really not a, a gift that should be used in, in a widespread way in, on a Sunday morning sitting like this. Uh, it's for my own personal communication with the Lord and praise of the Lord. We call it a prayer language or a praise language, and, and I think that it is used. Now, is it for, does everybody get it? Uh, it seems like no. Paul would say later on, does everybody speak in tongues? No, they don't. Not everybody has a gift. These tongues are, or these gifts are distributed uh, to the whole body as God sees fit. And so we see there in Romans 8.26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is a common verse that's used to kind of support that idea of a, a prayer language. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so it's to help us uh, pray. And obviously, you know, I don't know if you struggle with this, probably not. Uh, when, when you're praying, you know, sometimes you, you just can't come up with the words. You know, you, you feel like you're repeating yourself over and over again. I'm saying the same things all the time to God. And, you know, I, I think the gift of tongues, really, for, for me personally, uh, it does work in that way. When I run out of the ability to communicate to God what I want to communicate to Him or what I even know I can communicate to Him, uh, when I have that just weakness of the language that I have and the ability that I have to speak to God, you know, it really comes and, and fills that gap and allows me to speak to Him in a way that I wouldn't normally be able to. And so we have that. We, we can see that it was, first of all, a, a means of getting the message out and certainly can be used in that way today. And you've heard stories of missionaries out on the mission field being able to communicate to somebody who has a different language that they've never spoken in. And uh, certainly I, I can almost see how that works. You know, uh, I've been in a couple of different countries at different times over the years where I went to a church service and the whole church service was all in a different language and I had no idea what they were saying. But as I just prayed and said, all right, Lord, help me get something out of this, you know, help me understand it somehow, some way. And, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you that I know exactly what they said. I, I didn't understand their words as they were speaking, but I was blessed by it. And at, at the end of that service, I felt like I had received something from the Lord. The Lord was speaking to me, whether I could hear or understand what their voices were saying or not. I really got something out of it. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, that passage goes on to say, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And so there is definitely... Uh, he who speaks edification, exhort, exhortation, and comfort to men. That's the gift of prophecy as we looked at last uh, week. You're edifying the body of Christ. And so it's much more preferable for somebody to prophesy in church because everybody can hear it. But if you're speaking in tongues, you're only edifying yourself and you're not building up the body of Christ. And so uh, we'll talk more about how the, all that works. Last thing I want to look at in verse 22 of that same chapter there, 1 Corinthians 14. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. And so we see those things working together. And uh, again, we'll talk more about that as we get into these chapters. All right. Well, let's just praise the Lord here for one last time. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we, we do... Uh, admit, Father, that our faith is weak. Lord, we do admit that uh, we have a hard time believing that miracles can happen, that you can heal somebody of a disease. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would pour out upon us a gift of faith 
each one of us, Lord. We want to have a, a deeper abiding faith in you. A faith that produces action. Heavenly Father, a faith that uh, produces uh, work and energy and, and power in our lives. That we may go out into this community and be effective for you. And to bring in a harvest that is glorifying to you. Lord, we know that, that we need these things uh, from you, Lord, and, and, and we can't accomplish them in any other way. And so we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us, upon the people in this room today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.